Now you'll remember Nicodemus came to Jesus and Jesus is explaining this to him in John chapter 3 and Nicodemus, you know, that's mind-blowing. And he obviously says the obvious thing is, how do I do that? You know, how's that possible? And so really what we're looking at then is what's involved in this? And notice Jesus' response to him. He says, Jesus replied, I assure you, that no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and of spirit. Now those two things are going to be highlighted as we go through this morning. So he's saying, if you want to have this, this spiritual life, the first step in this, in this is you need to be born again. And that process involves water and spirit. So in order to understand what he's talking about here, in Jewish thought, Hebrew thought, you're either unclean, clean, or holy. Okay? So there's those three alternatives. Either unclean, clean, or holy. Now God has said that he desires that we be what? Clean or holy? Holy. His ideal is, is that we be holy. And to understand what that means is, is basically when you see the idea of, of holy, it is God's presence. So if he's wanting us to be holy, it means that he's wanting to be what? Present with and in us. But the reality is that when Adam sinned, we became unclean. So there's two steps from the unclean. First step, to be clean. The second step then, to be holy. And so we, um, we need to, if you like, work through these, these steps in order to get there. So the first step is they don't believe. Second step is then we believe in Jesus. And then the third step is we receive the Holy Spirit. So we, to, belief then involves, one, what? Believing in Jesus. So we, you could say in shorthand, we believe. And then when we believe, we receive. Okay? So that's the, the, the process, if you like, in Jewish thought. So let's just highlight this. So there's the conviction that comes. We respond, we respond by repenting of our sins, turning to God, be baptized in the name of the Jesus Christ for your forgiveness of sin. How many sins? What does that mean? Yeah, what does that mean? Yeah, but what does that mean? The sins that I've committed in the past, the sins that I'm committing now and the sins that I will commit. Isn't that everything? So when Jesus died on the cross, he took everything, all our sins, didn't he? The ones that we have, we are, and we will. So then when we come then to forgiveness and we accept the cross and we are forgiven, what sins are forgiven? Past, present, and future. What an awesome God, isn't he? Isn't he? And so then he says then, once I have now cleaned you, and we'll break that down in a little while, is once I've cleaned you, I promise to give you the Holy Spirit. In other words, I want to be present with you. So when we go back to, to um, Genesis and Adam and Eve, and Eve, she wanted to be like who? She wanted to be like Satan? No. If you look at that, she wanted to be like God. And she did what so often we do. We say, I want to be like God. Now what do I have to do to be like God? And so she said, right, I'm going to eat of the tree 
of good and evil. But God then, what did he? Immediately, he provided salvation. And he forgave them. And it's interesting, if you look at the Hebrew and, and the wording used, the um, Garden of Eden is actually the sanctuary, the temple, because where was God? He was in there. And so he was there, and Adam and Eve were priests of his, working in the temple. The, the language conveys that idea. So, so therefore, then he wants us then, then to come into, once we have accepted the Holy Spirit, then he says, look, there's two laws that I want you to follow. What? First one is to love the Lord your God with what? All your heart, all your soul, and your neighbor as yourself. In other words, community. So that's what we're looking at. So now let's go back to our, and modernize it. And so what we've got, sacrifice, or we've got baptism. Because when you are baptized, you are connected to who? You are become one with Jesus Christ. And so, did Jesus need to be baptized? This is a trick question. Did he need to be baptized? Yes, and take it another step. Because what did Jesus say when he was baptized to John? John said, hey, I should be baptized. You should be baptizing me. But what did Jesus say? It is the will of my Father. It's the will of God that I be baptized. And so that just highlights how important this idea and, and where baptism stands. So he then says, the baptism, you're justified. Then you are sanctified when you receive the Holy Spirit. Now that's nothing you do. That's a gift of God. This is, because what we're looking at here is, is here's a picture of a God who wants to be connected to you and I, who is doing everything he can to reconnect and walk with us. Isn't he awesome? Because if God didn't do this, could we connect with God? No. We're dependent on him wanting to be connected to us. And so the plan of salvation is all about that. And so what he's saying is, is now, I want you to be baptised and in essence, you're looking at a murderer. Because I've baptized a number of people. And when I baptize a person, what am I doing? Taking them down into the water and drowning them. And then bringing them back up into new life. That's what it is to be born again is to be, I'm dying to self and I'm now coming back to live in and for Christ Jesus. And that's, so that's what baptism is. And then so that's moving us then to a place that we can connect and be one with God and be made holy so that God's presence is with us. So, with that then, now, you know, as Adventists, people look at us as a little odd because we believe in what is called the pre-Advent or the investigative judgment. Now, what's this got to do with baptism? Well, if you go to, to John, for example, take your Bibles with me and turn to John 3. The most, one of the, the most famous... Um, you know, text in the whole Bible, which is John 3, 16. And notice, in John three sixteen, it says, For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. True? Okay. 
So what do we mean by believe? So if I read that and I understand belief is just belief, it's saying if I just believe, I'm going to have eternal life, doesn't it? But is that what he's saying? Is that, are we understanding it correctly like that? Because if you come up to um, uh, verse 18, there is no judgment against anyone who believes in him, but anyone who does not believe in him has already been, what? Judged. Okay? Now, come down, with, down to verse 31 with me. Uh, sorry, 36. Anyone who believes in God's Son has eternal life. But anyone who doesn't obey the Son will never experience eternal life but remain under God's angry judgment. That's the New Living Translation. Because in the Bible, to believe is to act, is to obey. You can't separate the two ideas. It's like um, to listen, you'll see quite often as you go through the Bible, it says hear or listen. So in Hebrew, there's no, no word for obey. Because it's assumed that if you listen, you will what? Obey. If you hear, you act on what you hear. You know, you mothers or fathers here and you tell your children to do something, what do you expect them to do? To listen to what you've said and to do it. And God's the same. And so when we see this idea of saying, believe, so if I believe in God, that means that I'm going to act in accordance with God. But the problem is, that I'm born with a bias towards sin. And so God says, I'm going to change your heart and put a new, what, spirit in you in Ezekiel 36. He tells us. So what we have then here is we have these three ideas of don't believe, they're judged already. Believe, but don't obey. And that's where we need that investigation. Because God, you know, because I can say I believe and then I'm going to go off and just do what I want to do. Now, if I say I believe, who do I represent? Yeah, I represent that God, don't I? If I'm claiming to believe in God, I am a representative of God and I am a Child of God, aren't I? So I'm amongst two. What? Family. Aren't we? Because we're all children of God. And so therefore we are representatives of God out in the community. And then he says, then there's a third group, so we've got three groups. Don't believe and using that unclean, clean, holy idea, don't believe they would be what? Unclean. Believe they are clean or claim to be clean. And then you've got a third group who have believed and have received the gift of the Holy Spirit and therefore are right with God and are spirit-led. So the issue is not whether you are right with God. Now listen carefully. The issue is not whether you are right with God. Because at the cross, what did Jesus do? Romans 5, he restored us so we were right with God. Okay? Now, who did he restore to be right with God? Hmm? Who did, who did he make right with God on the cross? Hmm? Everyone. Didn't he? 
Did he die for everyone? Yes. And he made, therefore, he made everyone right with God. Now, the question is, do I accept that? Do I accept what he has done? And so the issue is not whether we're right with God. Christ has done that. That's sorted at the cross. We are, we have been moved from unclean to clean. The question is, do I accept that? So then, judgment is not about whether we're right with God or not. So if judgment's not about whether we're right with God, because let's, are we judged by the Ten Commandments? Does God judge us by the Ten Commandments? No. Because we are right with God. Aren't we? So when Christ looks at Jesus and looks at us, who does he see? He sees the Son. And so therefore, if judgment is not about what, whether we're right with God, what, it, what is it about? The issue is, am I, are you, living as a righteous child of God, committed and dependent on God? So the question, you know, what's happened is, is that we have moved from unclean to clean and I'm claiming now to be a child of God. But I can't do that apart from who? God. I am dependent on God in order to be holy. Because holiness is being in the presence of who? God. That, so Christianity is all about that. So now let's look at that. So empowered then by his spirit and doing his will. So in Jesus then, in Matthew chapter three, uh, 12, says, I tell you, every sin and every blasphemy, blasphemy can be forgiven, except one. And what is that one? The Holy Spirit. Why? Because when Jesus died on the cross, what did he cover? Every sin, didn't he? And so every sin is able to be forgiven. The issue then is that God wants us to live as a holy person. A person living in the presence of God. And so that's where the judgment is, as we've just looked at. The judgment is about, are you living dependent? Let's go back. Are you living as someone who is committed and dependent on God and empowered by his Holy Spirit? Are we living as someone who's led by his spirit, by God, or am I living as someone who's trying to act like I'm like that? And that's what the investigators or the pre-advent judgment is all about. It's determining, here's someone who's claimed to be a child of God. Are they living as a child of God? And I can't live as a child of God Unless God is living in and walking with me. So it comes back to then, Christianity is all about being dependent on God. All right, let's move back to there where we were. So here, if you look at... If, and. One of the things I love to do, and if you've got some time, I really encourage you, when you're going through the Gospels, I will bring up a, um, what do you call it? You know, this spreadsheet. And as you see up there, you know, put down what does Mark say, what does Matthew say, what does Luke say, and what does John say. And it really rounds out the picture. Because here you can see, for example, Matthew tells us a lot more. He tells us, um, anyone who speaks against the Son of Man can be forgiven. The others don't tell us that. But he says, 
Anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. Why? Who did Jesus come to reveal? Who did Jesus come to reveal? The Father. Exactly. And so if I am claiming to be a Christian and I am representing someone else other than God, he says, what? That's something that ultimately is unforgivable. So let's, we need to break this down. So in um, John 7, Jesus says, He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom, he, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given it, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Okay? So you get what he's saying there? Basically he's saying that when you believe, you will receive. And Galatians chapter 3 highlights this in verses 2, 5 and 14. When you believe, you receive. Now the question is, am I going to then follow and live as a child of God? We are forgiven, we are justified by Christ on the cross. The issue, we have rejected Jesus' Well, if we've, um, uh, this is answering the question, what if it, as a child of God or a right, someone who is righteous in Christ turn away from God and then come back? We, we are forgiven because we've been justified by Christ on the cross. The issue, we have rejected Jesus' as a sacrifice at some point, Jesus' as leadership. The Spirit haven't been willing to listen and obey. Do not submit to God's law. If you don't have the Spirit, you don't belong to God. So, I've rejected God. And then, praise God, under the leadership and empowerment and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, I come back to God. What needs to be done? What, what has to, you know, what's the process then? Well, the first thing is, let's look at some examples of people who were in this situation. Jesus told the story of the prodigal son. And the prodigal son, beautiful story, he um, ends up in, well, in a what? A pig pen. Fighting the pigs for food. And in there, it says, he came back to his senses and he started to think. He said, look, if I go home, I'll be better off working as a slave for my father. So he heads back to his father. He comes back to his father and says, Father, I've done this and done that and I've done this other thing. And what does the father do? Does he listen to him? He has compassion on him. He puts new sandals on his feet, gives him a cloak. You know, he accepts him as if he had never gone away. True? He restores him to what he was, which upset his, his brother. But this, that is the... Because in the Jewish system, if you um, wanted to repent, they had a formula you had to go through. And Jesus is, is unraveling that formula and he's saying, hey, come back. And God will do everything. Now, I'm going to go off track here a little, but it's really connected. In Numbers chapter 20 and verse 12 is an incredible story. Jesus, uh, sorry, um, no, that's the wrong one. In Genesis 15, sorry, Abraham has a dream. And he dreams what they used to do if they were um, having a covenant relationship is they would get an animal and cut it in half. Okay? And here he's told to get an animal, cut it in half, and then they would walk between the animal. The two people making this covenant between them, they would walk between the animal. 
And in walking between the animal, they were saying, if I don't keep this covenant, you have the right to kill me. Okay, so it comes up time for the Abraham and God to walk between the animals. And you know what happens? In this dream, Abraham sees something that's totally different. He sees a, a pot, fire pot, and a smoking pot walking, going between the two animals, the two sides of the animals. Now, where do you see a cloud and a fire cloud in the Bible? Hmm? Yeah, leading them. In other words, what's God saying here? God is saying, I will, you can kill me if I don't keep this covenant, and you can kill me if you don't keep the covenant. That's the gospel, isn't it? Isn't that awesome? God's saying, hey, I'm going to be responsible on both sides. Knowing that Abraham would not be able to keep the covenant. Knowing that you or I would not be able to keep the covenant. And what's the covenant? Exodus chapter 19, 4 to 6. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. Love your neighbor. And I will take you through to the promised land. That's the covenant relationship. That's what God requires of us. To be obedient to him, to be a loving expression of him. So, here we have the prodigal son. Another example. The woman caught in adultery. She's lying there, expecting to be stoned. And what does Jesus say to her? I don't condemn you. Go and what? Sin no more. Then you have Zacchaeus. Now Zacchaeus climbs the tree to see Jesus and everyone is upset. You know, the crowd's upset with him because Jesus says to, to Zacchaeus what? I'm coming to your house for tea, as the song says. Now, Jesus should not have anything to do with him because Zacchaeus was unclean. Because what was he doing? He was ripping off, robbing his own people, wasn't he? And, God, and Jesus is saying, hey, I, I see you're unclean, but I see you as a holy person. And then you see him then return to those that he'd stolen from. And then you have the Apostle Peter. What did he do? Three times. Not only did he deny Jesus, he swore in that denial. And then he looks at Jesus. And then Jesus gives him the look. Now, gentlemen, um, does your wife have the look? Yeah. Uh, those at the back are nodding. <laughs> those that are sitting beside their wives, they keep them very still. <laughs> but they do, don't they? They have the look. You know, oh, I'm in trouble. <laughs> it's the look. I think they go to a special school to teach wives the look. I'm not talking about that look. When Peter saw Jesus... He saw compassion. Here is Peter has, in fact, when he's denying Jesus, moved from being clean to unclean. And Jesus looks at him with a look of compassion so that when Jesus then uh, dies and rose, rises again, and Mark it records that Jesus tells the women to go back and tell the disciples that he's alive, but in Mark he mentions, tell Peter. Isn't that beautiful? That's, that's the God that we serve. Oh, I'm over time now. I'm in trouble. I better keep moving. Sorry. Okay, so then um, we, we come, let's try and bring this all together in terms of baptism then. Baptism is life is a journey and we are growing more and more like Christ. It's a growth in a relationship. As guided by the Holy Spirit, 
that produces spiritual fruits and spiritual gifts, a growth that is inhibited if we fail to listen and obey. The sins of rejecting, replacing, and the consequences that that means. In Romans, oops, sorry, for all have, uh, are led by the Spirit of God are children of God, i.e. those who are holy, children of God. Now, quickly, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14, a very important text, it says there that one, you are perfect. In other words, what? You are righteous because of what Christ has done. You are perfect. I am in the midst of a perfect people. But then he says, growing, or this idea of growing in holiness. So our growth in holiness is something that is happening as we come closer and become more and more like God. And since we are his children and his heirs, in fact, together with Christ, we are all heirs of glory. And then in Acts chapter 12, 19, it says, they came to Paul and said, um, there's this discussion about, he asks the question, have you been baptized into the Holy Spirit? And they say, no, we were baptized into what? John's baptism. And so he says, all right, you need to be baptized again. So he rebaptizes them into who? Into what? Into Jesus' baptism. Now, if you're baptized into Jesus' uh, baptism, what are you? Forgiven. Forgiven for what? Forgiven for sins that happened when? In the past, in the present, and in the future. So the question is not, do I have to do something and be rebaptized in order to be forgiven? That is something that has already been done, hasn't it? Because of what Christ did on the cross. All of those examples we gave you there, not one of them is recorded as being rebaptized. Classic example, Peter. As soon as he received the Holy Spirit, God, Jesus said to him, you know, wait in here, pray in here, Commit your lives to God in here and I will send you the Holy Spirit. And then it's recorded that they received what? Fire from heaven. So when you are baptized, when you reconnect with God, he gives you then the Holy Spirit. Now, there's something that in the Adventist church, Normally, COVID-19 knocked it around a bit, but normally we have what is called communion. And communion is where we recommit to God. You know, it, it's made up of basically of, of three parts, but basically two. One, the water, and I, uh, sorry, the bread, and the bread represents what? The body of Christ. And then you have the grape juice. And what does that represent? The Holy Spirit. Because the blood is the life. And if you look at John and his use of, of it and that sort of thing, so basically what we're saying is, we are recommitting. When we take part in the communion service, uh, what four times a year in the Adventist church normally, is we are recommitting to Jesus Christ and asking for the Holy Spirit to lead in our lives. And that's why if you go to 1 Corinthians 11, Paul makes a big issue and he says there, if you've offended your brother, what are you to do? Restore relationships. In other words, it's similar, if you like, to the, um, the Day of Atonement when they were required to, you know, consecrate themselves in preparation for it. So the communion service 
is really a rebaptism, where we recommit, make right, restore, because we want to live as God's holy people. Now, there may be some here that haven't made that decision to be baptised. And I'd encourage you to talk to to the leaders of the church here about making a decision to be a son or daughter of Jesus Christ so that he can come and dwell and be one in you and use you for his glory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you don't leave us as unclean as we deserve. That you are able to bring us to a place where we can be one with you. We can come into your presence. And Lord, one day we're looking forward to be able to do that face to face. And we thank you for that hope in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.